Welcome to In Studio. I'm Jade Daniels. Our guest this week is vocalist Patrice Jegu. Recently, she released her latest album, If It Ain't Love. For the release, she's joined by an all-star cast, including the vocal sextet Take Six and the renowned Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra. While If It Ain't Love showcases her musical prowess, it's her life story that gives us an even greater appreciation for her talents. Our conversation begins with the question, Throughout your many chapters of life, what are those things that have kept you moving forward? Here's Patrice Jigou. I think it's important to have people in your world, in your musical, in your musical world and non-musical world, who are positive, encouraging, and brutally honest. So while I'd like to take the credit for, oh, I'm propelling myself forward in my career, that's not 100% true. It helps to be married to someone who's like, uh, that was out of tune. Do it again. <laughs> you know, or um, you're dragging the tempo. I think we should consider <laughs> either a different tempo or do that again. Um, my voice teacher is very honest. Uh, my sister is very honest. Uh, my friends are very honest. And um, I'm not saying it's all bad, like, oh, you're out of tune or you didn't do it well or something. It's not that. It's like, wow, you knocked it out of the park. Go, girl. Good for you. Keep doing that. Keep working on that thing. So I do have a very clear vision of what it is I'm trying to do and trying to achieve, but it helps to have positive, constructive, honest people in my circle. So over the years, music has always been present within your family, within those around you, and and as you mentioned, uh, your husband. Uh, is involved not only as one who is musically inclined but helps you with the production Mm -hmm. of your recordings but music specifically what role has that played in your life can we go back in the time machine for a second the way back machine machine. (laughs) (laughs) okay well here's the thing so as a figure skater music especially classical music is part of our dna because all of our skating routines, well, like back in the day when I was skating, it was all classical music. Um, we also, with the ice dancing, it was all cl- mainly all classical music, or it was quasi Muzak settings of popular tunes. But the point being, uh, it wasn't pop music, it, it wasn't vocal music of any sort. So, you know, after skating for a hundred years, it's that was part of my DNA because every skater has to be able to skate in rhythm skate on the beat skate in three four skate in four four skate in six eight because of the various dances through ice dance so there's that my mom also sent us to a school that had chapel and choir so um, we had music class I don't know if schools still have music class some do and some don't but we did and the school she sent us to at least for for me from grades one to grade nine had congregational singing slash choral singing as part of chapel service so it wasn't too weird to just learn how to harmonize like on the spot when we were in chapel so the person next to you is singing the melody And then the person on the other side of you is improvising a harmony as like a kid. So that that was in my ear. That was in my DNA. What's also in my ear was my mom was a keyboard player, self-taught. And when I say keyboard, her primary instrument was organ. And, you know, she would improvise and sing and play in the house. She also played guitar and fiddle. My uncle plays fiddle and keyboards, etc., etc. So that was like kind of in me um but you know i was a late bloomer i came to music a little bit later even though my first instrument also was organ by the way (laughs) yeah um but you know what i (laughs) you might laugh i didn't like my teacher because he was mean Mm. yeah so i just did not want to continue on with organ lessons for that reason and i'm very sad about that because i'm jealous of all organ players because it's cool, you can play the bass with your foot, you can play the bass with your left hand, you've got all these colors to choose from with, you know, literally, I'm pulling out all the stops, you know. Um, I came to music a little bit later, as you know, and um, it, my my husband, wow, I mean, I'm the one with the doctorate, but he should have one too, because his, the depth and breadth of knowledge that that man has uh, is really mind-blowing, and I've learned a lot from him. 
music was in the home, as you mentioned. Your mother played the organ. You were in choir in school. But did you see yourself as a vocalist? I mean, someone who would go out and do performances or sing professionally? Or were you one who said, yeah, I sing, but I'm not really a singer? I definitely knew I was a performer. There was no doubt about that. I knew somehow, some way, I would probably make a living performing. That that was kind of a given. And I I think I was 10 when I knew I could sing. Like, I'm like, oh, I can, I, I can, I can kind of sing. Um, but, you know, coming from a small town in Canada, I didn't know anyone who was a professional musician. I didn't know anyone that studied music uh, in university or anything like that. So that was not on my radar. I, I didn't even know you could really pursue this per se. Um, but I, I thought it could be possible. What did it take for you, as talented as you were as a skater, what did it take for you to begin seriously looking into the possibility of becoming a vocalist to receive training in that realm? I was skating in an ice show in Mexico uh, in the early 90s, and the show was called Hollywood on Ice. (laughs) And it was a production, uh, a joint production through Richard Porter Productions, Las Vegas, and Hermanos, Hermanos Fuentes Gasca, Mexico City. And that probably doesn't matter. But anyway, a cast member in the show Uh, actually a new cast member he came down from Vancouver and he had already skated in a lot of ice shows but he also had done a lot of musical theater and he and I were just chatting and singing and goofing off during intermission one day and he just sort of casually said to me you know I think you have a good voice Um, when you go back to Canada why don't you think about taking some voice lessons and so I did he planted that seed and I contacted uh, a high school te- a high school English teacher that I had who taught voice on the side and I called her up and I said hi Mrs. Randell I don't know if you remember me blah 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 uh, could I take voice lessons with you so that's what I did I started voice lessons with her and I just kind of started getting some momentum basically by studying privately until I you know went forth from there much of the music that you did early on was classically based and as you told me before the inter- interview, you're a lyrical mezzo-soprano. So for those who are not familiar with the particular terms of how to define one's range, where did that place you as far as a classical vocalist? What were the things that you worked on? Things along those lines. Sure. A lyric mezzo-soprano um, is a voice type that often sings trouser roles or the travesti roles, like carabino and so forth. But a lyric mezzo-soprano is also a voice that is um, noteworthy for its agility and flexibility. So a lyric mezzo-soprano often will sing a lot of the bel canto repertoire by, say, Bellini, Donizetti, Rossini, uh, the florid Mozart repertoire, etc. So um, that... Actually, when I started my undergraduate degree, my my voice teacher, Donald Bell at the University of Calgary, he heard that quality in my voice very early on and, and promoted that study of the agility in that particular repertoire. So that's sort of my classical world, my classical voice. And you had performed classically for several years. You received a bachelor's, a master's, and eventually a doctorate in classical performance from Rutgers. Yeah right here in uh, New Jersey. So what was it? What was the catalyst that made you think, perhaps there's something more that I could do than just classical? What made you go from being strictly classical to seriously considering being a jazz vocalist of all things? (laughs) Two things happened. So back in 2008, I gave a recital in Peru and I decided, and it was a classical recital, but for my encore, I prepared Till There Was You from The Music Man. Yeah. And the um, applause after the classical recital, the classical sets, you know, um, was nice and polite and what have you, the audience responded. But when I sang Till There Was You, they went nuts. 
I was I looked at my friend my pianist I was like uh okay like the audience really applauded with such vigor I was totally shocked so I went off stage and my, my pianist and I went off stage and they were still applauding this was in Trujillo Peru and I said to the <laughs> my friend my the pianist I said what should I do he's like well we should go out and do it again so I did I went out and just sang it again and they just kept applauding and I thought okay this is a sign like if they're more excited about the encore that I had to sing twice because <laughs> I only prepared one yeah. which is musical theater more than they are about all the classical stuff I just sang I should take that to heart so that was the first thing the second first sign let's say this and the second thing or the second sign um, was uh, my husband planting the seed of hey honey I really think you should consider recording a non-classical album because shor shortly after well let's see we started dating in 2006 I had just recorded a classical record in Spain with Christina Pato and um, he heard it and was like oh yeah okay and then we got married. He's like, hey, you know what? I really think you, you, you need to embark on a different path, a different journey. Um, so I, I want to help you with that. And I, and I want to rec record this with you. And actually, it's funny. I, <laughs> Jay, you'll laugh. I said, oh, yeah, well, we could record something in the living room because I have GarageBand on my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's like, um, uh, yeah, honey, no, no, no. We're going to do this the right way. We're actually going to do this the right way. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just leave it in your hands because he knows how to produce records. So, Moving right along from that, <laughs> our guest on In Studio is Patrice Jegu. She's uh, just released the album If It Ain't Love. And transitioning from being a classically driven vocalist to a jazz vocalist. It's not the easiest thing in the world. And there are some who can do them simultaneously, but when you're first learning one or the other, there are challenges along the way. So for you, you've been trained in a certain manner. Yeah. And a lot of the classical techniques can be applied to jazz, mm -hmm. but there are certain things that they don't teach you yeah. in classical performance. Yeah. So for you, becoming a jazz vocalist and going in that direction, what were some of those early challenges that you had to face and overcome? That is such a great question. That really, really, it is. Because, um, you know, we were chatting a little bit before we, yes. you know, started the interview. And we were talking a little bit about how sometimes a classical singer will record a pop album or a jazz album or this album or that album. And sometimes it works, but a lot of times it doesn't. Um, and for me, I really did not want to, quote, sound like a classical singer singing jazz, if you know what I mean. So the challenge for me, and I'm going to give you nuts and bolts, real specifics here. So um, for this particular record, If It Ain't Love, I, my, again, going back to my husband, he really encouraged me to get with uh, a voice teacher, a new voice teacher, not one from my university days, who not only specialized in a popular technique, I, I, and that's not even the right way to describe it, because they, they, they're still specializing in vocal technique. Yeah. But because the literature is totally different and the vocalism is very different, the technique is totally different. It, in other words, Jay, it's like if a ballet dancer says, okay, I want to dance hip hop now, they're going to dance with an accent. You're still going to see their classical training in hip hop, right? Well, I, I didn't want that. I wanted to not, I can never totally get rid of it, but if I could get a good teacher to help me sing in a new way, I, I felt I could be more successful. So the difference between me singing, quote unquote, as a classical singer and a jazz slash pop singer is well, the keys that I choose or the tessitura, that is the vocal range, um, and the amount of singing I do in chest voice. So for example, as a classical singer, I like never hardly ever sing in chest voice it's usually voce mista mixed voice right or head voice or what have you chest voice might be used for the um odd rare dramatic flourish or that kind of thing but we don't belt and i had to learn how to belt and I didn't know how to belt. Actually, I was scared. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going to blow up my voice. I'm going to get nodes. I'm going to get nodules. So when I started working with my voice coach, my new voice coach, new, I've been working with him for three years, that is the kind of thing we had to start to deal with. Like, okay, how do I sing in chest voice without hurting myself? The other thing, um, and how do I learn to, to, to belt 
in a very high manner, high part of my voice without hurting my voice. And we, I have learned to do that. Um, also singing with using straight tone. When I was trained in my undergraduate studies, for four years, my teacher beat into me, every note must have vibrato. Every note. Even if it's a 16th note. It has to be vibrant and vibrating and have vibrato. So now, as a singing jazz music, if I have vibrato on every note, I sound like an opera singer trying to sing jazz. So singing with straight tone is a new animal for me, and it's kind of laughable, right? It's like, when you sing a straight tone, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? The big deal is if you've been singing for 25 years with vibrato on every note, no matter the note value, to sing without vibrato uh, is like learning a new way to walk or run or breathe, you know? So those are just a couple of the things. I know I sort of went on, but I like to nerd out with vocal technique stuff, though. Here's the other thing that just really blew my mind when I started singing popular music, okay? Singing with a microphone. Ta-da! Right, who knew, right? Because as a classical singer, we never sing with a microphone. It's just, right? And so uh, here's one thing that might make you laugh. Well, not laugh, it's kind of interesting. When I started my undergraduate studies with Donald Bell at the University of Calgary as a classically trained singer, in my first, I think it actually was my first lesson, um, you know, chatting, getting to know him, he's getting to know me, whatever. He's like, so Patrice, I just need you to know that I'm going to train you to sing in a building that seats a minimum of 1,500 people over a full orchestra without amplification. And I was like, um, okay, if you say so. And that's exactly what he did. Then getting in the studio and singing, recording with a microphone or performing using a microphone. Honestly, I know it sounds weird and I, maybe some of your listeners are going, oh honey, what's the big deal? It, yeah, As a classical singer, I am used to singing with such energy and athleticism and power but that doesn't work in in jazz and pop and gospel and country like you know it's more nuanced and you the microphone is like a totally new instrument if you will so believe it or not just learning how to sing with amplification is a whole new skill set it's as though that you have another singing partner yeah. that you're having to work with. Oh, absolutely. And I had come from singing with a microphone before. I received my classical training, so I was able to work with the two. But now, because my voice has a tendency to be louder, sometimes I have to back off the mic. <laughs> so this is your second jazz album that you put out, If It Ain't Love. just came out earlier this year. Tell us about some of the work that went into this. Uh, and also, in describing some of the preparation, the production. Talk about how this differs from your first work. Wow, well, I'll tell you, it was a steep learning curve yeah. with the first record. Because remember, I had, I had gone from, oh, I'm a classical singer to now, oh, I'm not really a classical singer, but still kind of am. And now this record, it's like, okay, we're done with the classical. Y you really, you have to bring your A game, a new A game to this. So in terms of the preparation for this album, the first part of it actually was preparing the repertoire, just selecting the literature, the, the songs to record. So my husband and I had like these, uh, you know, long listening parties where we just listened to repertoire and repertoire and repertoire and repertoire. And we would listen to like 40 versions of Lover Come Back to Me. Or we would research every version we could possibly find on Amazon, on iTunes, on YouTube, on Tidal, T-I-D-A-L, the streaming service of, um, of uh, If It Ain't Love. And if the song had been recorded a ton of times, we shelved it. We're like, no, okay, we, we, this, everyone and their dog has recorded this, okay? That's not worth it for us. And can I truly bring something new to it? Eh, I don't know. We did make a few exceptions. Um, but that's, that's where we started with that. And then my husband, who is a producer, and as I was telling you before we got started, if you find a producer, protect and love and cherish that special creature yes <laughs> pet them <laughs> pet them rub their feet get them coffee and donuts whenever they ask for it because they're such a valuable person do you do this for your husband on a regular basis <laughs> i do not and i should <laughs> 
I, I make him coffee in the morning, and when I'm feeling particularly generous, I do make him breakfast. So, I hope yeah, yeah, I hope he does too. But anyway, <laughs> so um, we once we started, once we got the repertoire kind of moving and yeah. and getting it together, some things made it and some things changed. We, we knew we had to get cracking and that we at least had to book one session to, to start recording rhythm tracks. And um, there were two people that were very pivotal in getting the ball rolling. One was Mike Lang, the very well-known um, studio pianist from Hollywood. And the other one was Jorge Calandrelli, the Jorge Calandrelli, Barbara Streisand, Tony Bennett, Lady Gaga, two-time Oscar nominee, a six-time Grammy winner, I forget. And once they came on board, that's really when we started gaining traction and we really started moving forward. And our first recording session was at Capitol Studios in Hollywood on September 25th, 2015. You walk into a place like Capitol, where all of the greats have you know, recorded over the years. Frank, yeah. Ella, mm-hmm. Peggy Lee, others. Did that humble you in any way? Totally. Oh, yeah. I mean, you walk down the halls and there's, you know... A picture of Nat King Cole and there's another picture of Frank Sinatra Nora Jones for your more contemporary artists and stuff like that and um, yeah it's intimidating but it's also exhilarating um, it's it's humbling very very humbling and then also to be working with I, I didn't mention this to be working with Al Schmidt the Al Schmidt to be working with Don Murray, the Don Murray. These are two giants of the recording industry in the uh, recording engineering world. Anybody who's anybody knows who these people, these two gentlemen are because they're world-class recording engineers. And yeah, it. <laughs> I could blab on about that, but yes, very humbling for sure. Getting the players together, there were several stories out of that. And if you could just kind of tell us about some of the players whom you had on the album. Mm-hmm. But... You listen to the finished product, and it's a wonderful production. Is it what you anticipated it would be, or was it that anticipation and then some? To be honest, I had no expectations, which was kind of my strategy, because I was a little bit sort of reluctant to have expectations, because if they were not met, then I would be disappointed, right? Um, And I didn't want to get I I didn't want to be in control too too much because for me if I'm in control too much then I kill the spontaneity when I'm in the studio does that make sense so I had to really trust my husband and and by the way my husband wasn't the only producer on the record Uh, David Page from Toto produced a couple of tracks on my record Mike Lang um, and Jorge Calandrelli as well so for me you know you talked about the anticipation actually just like handing over control that was really really hard because as you know I'm an independent artist and this is my record label and this record came out on my record label (laughs) so you really have to trust these titans but it ain't easy because you're the artist and it's all so close to you so I totally didn't answer your question other than to say I just tried not to have expectations but I'm very happy with the outcome that I will be very honest about yes what do you hope will come from this album features a great number of standards that people have heard but even on songs like lover come back to me it's what I like to call a fresh take on a familiar classic when the album was released a few months ago it has received some airplay Um, what are some other things that you're hoping will come from this release? Well, the first thing that I hope comes from this release is just name recognition, to be totally honest. You know, you and I were chatting before we started recording, and I'm not a household name. Not a ton of people know who I am. Some do, and some don't. And I just really hope that um, with the greater exposure of this project that uh, people will become more familiar with sort of who I am and what I do but honestly that they'll just enjoy the record they'll just love the music and just you know um, be excited and enthusiastic about the actual project Um, my hope is that promoters will hear it and that they'll take a chance on me and actually um, Jim Ernesto did take a chance on me, so did Kirk Whalum, because I just performed at the Burks Jazz Festival. So it did help that they 
could hear like Jim could hear the project and go, oh, okay, this is this person knows how to sing. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we can trust her if we put her on stage and stuff like that. So that that that's sort of my answer to that question. So you've had to work on being a classical vocalist. You've had to work hard at being a jazz vocalist. You've just put out your second album. For you as a person and as a performer, what is it that you're going to be working on over the next few months? Well, I'm sitting here with you in Newark, across at the Newark Hilton, having just come from my voice lesson in New York City. So I am still keeping my nose to the grindstone in terms of vocal technique because, again, and I know we sort of, I nerded out, as I said, you know, on talking about vocal technique. Um, I'm still learning how to do things that I don't know how to do as a singer. I mean, even as a classical singer, there's still a ton more I can learn, but I'm not in that sphere right now. Not all my energy is in that. All my energy is in this. And I need to keep my chops up because the repertoire for me is very demanding. And not not every song, but when you listen to the tracks, you'll go, you know, you hear some high notes at the end. You're like, oh, girl, what, what, wow, how'd you do that? How'd I do that? I went to my voice teacher and said, I need to do this. Teach me how. And he did. But I have to keep it up, right? It's like, you know, I talk, you're talking about me being a figure skater. If I don't go and work on a flying camel spin for 50 years and then go and try and do one I will hurt myself right same thing with vocal technique if I don't keep at it and I don't keep woodshedding I I lose the range or I lose the control or I use lose the whatever it is I'm trying to go for you know what I'm saying but also to uh it's important for me to keep listening to other singers learning riffs learning tricks learning oh he did this like one person I've been listening to a lot and just obsessing over is um, George Benson's version of This Masquerade. I'm like, oh, look, that noodle, that's so cool how he does that there. Oh, wow. Oh, okay, look what, he, oh, little vocal fry there. Oh, interesting. Huh, he breathed in between a word as a classical singer. <gasps> Clutch my pearls, how dare you? Ah, but it totally works and it's cool. So just listening and, and trying to increase my vocal vocabulary, so to speak, you know? Patrice Jegu, our guest from In Studio. She's released the new album, If It Ain't Love, and uh, it's quite a great release, and we're happy to feature it on Simply Timeless. Patrice, all the best to you and your family, and uh, thanks so much for taking the time to stop by. Thank you, Jay. Total privilege and pleasure to be here, and wishing you a ton of success with your show and your career. You can find out more information on the work of Patrice Jegu by visiting her website, Patrice Jegu. J-E-G-O-U, patricejegu.com. If It Ain't Love is distributed by Prairie Star Records. Until we meet again, I'm Jay Daniels. Thank you for joining us in studio.